you dream of a classroom where learning is natural? Can we inspire students to lifelong learning? What exactly is the purpose of an education? Inspiring students to be curious, independent, creative, innovative, deep thinking, confident, proactive, collaborative, determined, educated. Rise to the challenge of changing the world. This is teaching. This is learning. This is who we are. Welcome to the Tabletop Inventing Podcast. What is the best strategy for starting a makerspace in your school? How long should you take to plan your makerspace before you get started? Is flying by the seat of your pants a good idea or a bad one? What are the key features of an 8 foot tall DIY teeter-totter? Stay tuned for the answers in today's podcast. Hey there Innovation Nation! February is upon us and with it the plans for summer. If you have not yet planned your summer consider adding a couple of dates. June 28th through July 1st Tabletop Inventing will be at the Model Schools Conference in Atlanta, Georgia. We're excited because we got an exclusive invitation to put together a makerspace for the conference. We'll be back in Southern California after the conference for our Inventors Boot Camp series happening every week from mid-July through mid-August. Don't miss it. Inventors Boot Camp was the highlight of the year for many teens and teachers who attended last year. You heard me right. We invite a few teachers to participate at every boot camp and you'll want to reserve your spot early. We also want to remind you today that we're on Stitcher. Uh, our podcast is on Stitcher. And if you have friends with an Android phone, tell them about the Tabletop Inventing podcast on Stitcher. Just search Tabletop Inventing Stitcher on Google or look for Tabletop Inventing in the Stitcher app. As usual, listen, leave us feedback, and keep on innovating. Your feedback helps the podcast reach more sleeping innovators. Let's wake an innovation nation. Okay, that was a little cheesy, but we're going to keep it. Our guest today is Laura Fleming. Laura is a librarian and media specialist at New Milford High School in New Jersey. A little over a year ago, she started a makerspace in her library, and the results have been unbelievable. I'm not a fan of spoilers, so let's get straight to the interview. So my guest today is Laura Fleming, and Laura has been an educator for 17 years and has taught kindergarten all the way through 12th grade, both as a classroom teacher and as a librarian. She's also the creator of a digital badge-based professional learning platform for teachers and recently has written a book on makerspaces called Worlds of Making, Best Practices for Establishing a Makerspace in Your School, and that is published by Corwin and will be out soon. So, Laura, tell us a little more about that. Yeah, I'm really excited to have had the opportunity to take some of the things that we've discovered here in my makerspace at New Milford High School and put them in print um, to help people along in establishing their own makerspace for their own school communities. So we're really excited about that. So we first met actually at New Milford when I came to visit uh, you and Eric there at the school. Uh, tell me a little bit more about your makerspaces. I think that's probably what a lot of people here will be interested in. I was really recruited to come to New Milford High School by Eric to transform his unused library into a vibrant learning environment that students really needed and wanted and deserved um, and valued. Um, so it was a big challenge. You know, the first day of school here at New Milford High School, not one person came into the library. So I knew I had a challenge, but I didn't know really quite how big that challenge was until I, until I started here on the first day of school. But thanks to our makerspace, um, in a relatively short amount of time, we were able to transform our library into that vibrant learning environment that Eric had wanted. Wow. Nobody nobody came into the library at all on the first day of you came into no. the class. 
Yeah, literally wow. not one person. And I, I have put pictures online of our before and our after. And our before is just the room itself. And, you know, people say, well, you know, that's fine. But I tell them, no, this is in the middle of the school day. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't like in the morning before the kids came to school or after school. This is in the middle of the school day. Literally not one human being, no student, no staff member, no one walked into the into the library on that first day. I had no idea that that picture you gave me to put in the article that we wrote together actually was during the middle of the day. I thought it was yeah, before or after hours. No, 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 no. That was the first day of school in the middle of the day. <laughs> so I knew I had a big challenge, but honestly, I didn't realize how big it was until I started and realized that the, the library just was a non-essential place to everyone in this school. So tell us a little bit about the story of starting from there and building up a makerspace because a lot of our listeners are going to want to hear practical things that they can do uh, in the process of starting a makerspace. Yeah, I mean, all the time I get inquiries from schools all across the country and even the world who say to me, either in, in an email or through Google Hangout or Skype or whatever it might be, I have money, I just received a grant or my school just gave me some money to establish a makerspace. What do I buy? And 99% of the time, that's where people hit all of this from is, is what do I buy for this space? And, you know, that really wasn't where I came at it all from. To me, the first step in transforming your library into this kind of maker space is transforming the culture. Um, and the culture is a hard thing to change. Um, but really the culture of your library, of your makerspace, because our makerspaces aren't always in our libraries. Um, so wherever your makerspace is, um, the culture should encourage meaningful student learning and should provide the tools and the resources and opportunities for your students to be able to thrive and flourish in that kind of culture. So really in order to create that culture, I wanted our library, I wanted our makerspace to reflect the reality of our learners and give them opportunities to contribute to creating a dynamic community. Um, so really one of the first things that I did was I talked to the students. I went out into the hallway, I introduced myself because they weren't coming in. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you went to them. I went to them. Um, and I should say also that I'm a former student of this school. Um, and even as a student, I remember that no one used the library. And I myself have always loved libraries, um, but I didn't use the library at this school either. Um, so I had a perspective on that as a student, but I was interested in hearing from the students today about how they felt about the library and, and really just getting to know them and their interests and their wants and their needs. And so I had some interesting conversations with some children about the physical space of the library, um, but also about the things that they were interested in doing and learning about. Um, at times, you know, New Milford High School is a BYOD school. So at times I found myself even peering over their shoulders, you know, when they were in a computer lab, just looking to see what they were doing um, and getting a good feel on what it was they enjoyed doing when they had the time to do it particularly during their downtime, during their lunchtime hours. I, I walked around and I just observed and I watched and I looked at what it was they were interested in doing and had conversations with them during that time. So are there any stories that you remember uh, that kids told you or, or things that kids told you about um, what they liked doing that stick out in your mind? Well, I think one of the stories that resonated with me the most actually had to do with the physical space of the library itself. Um, we have a back room in our library that was actually the nonfiction section. And it was dark, it was dreary, and in my eyes, a little bit scary. I, I think it was haunted. <laughs> and even, <laughs> even as a student myself, I didn't think that we were allowed in that back room. I didn't realize it was even the nonfiction section. And it turned out that all of the students and even staff members that I spoke to on, on the, during those first few days actually thought the same exact thing. So, you know, one of the challenges was 
not only changing the culture of this space, but the physical space as well. So after hearing that, I realized that our library needed a little TLC and a little bit of a makeover. And you know, the first thing I targeted was that back room. I weeded the collection, I brightened it up, and we turned it into a lounge um, where students can go. And we have couches back there. Um, and it gives them another unique learning environment and definitely one that they wanted and now value. Well, if I remember correctly, you were actually moving a couch into this space when I was there. And, Probably, and, yeah. and what you just described doesn't look, doesn't, in my mind, doesn't sound anything like the room I saw while I visited. Yeah, it was really something, you know, it was really a, a cooperation amongst Eric, um, who gave me the autonomy to do anything in this space that I wanted to do. He, he definitely did not stand in my way and encouraged me completely you know, down to even our custodians who were always willing to lend a helping hand. They helped me take down the bookshelves in that room. Um, unfortunately, when we took down the bookshelves, we realized that the flooring needed some work and I didn't have any money in my budget um, to buy new flooring. So what I did was I tiled the back floor in dictionary pages. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was done when you were there. Um, but, <laughs> but it, it was great, and it, the room is bright, and it's one that kids flock to all throughout the school day, and it's used for many different purposes. That's a complete transformation. It is. It, it was a small change, but it got kids to come into the library. How long did it take you to get a trickle of kids coming into the library? Was it a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a month or two? You know, I when I get something in my mind, I want to do it. And I'm not a person who takes a ton of time to, you know, try things out or research them or beta test them. Um, you know, I just want to, I want to hit the ground running. And, you know, after seeing what I saw on the first day of school with nobody coming into the library, I said, you know, no more time can pass with this happening. I need to make changes and I need to make them now. So, you know, school started in mid-September. By the 1st of October, I think it was, we had some sort of maker space in place. Um, and I think, I think, you know, word got around throughout the school that there were changes being made in the library. And I think, you know, by the second or third day, even, kids started to become curious and started poking their head into the door and saw, you know, some little changes and, and gradually came in and then would tell their friends and then their friends would tell their friends and more and more kids um, started started showing up. And now I'm happy to say most lunch periods, our library is really a standing room only, which is fabulous. That is fabulous. Well, and yeah. I'm, I'm a bibliophile as well as a technophile. So right. both of those things are on high on my list. So I can't imagine an empty library. Right. But uh, that change, I think it'll be encouraging, I, I guess, to teachers that it doesn't have to take a long time to start making some significant changes in the library. So what are the first things you put in your makerspace? Well, um, you know, in that initial planning period, besides talking to the students, I spent a lot of time looking at our existing programs and classes and curricula, and I pulled some um, themes out of, you know, programs that were in place in our high school. And then I, I chose to add some themes to our makerspace that covered things that weren't in our high school in any way, shape, or form. For example, we didn't have a computer science teacher at the time, so computer coding was something that I felt our kids needed exposure to. So that was one of the themes that I, I chose to have in our makerspace, you know, right from the start. So, you know, before I even set anything up or purchased anything, I developed a list of themes for our space based on the conversations I had with the kids and based on our existing curricula and programs and offerings. And then I even took into account, um, you know, things that are important globally in education right now that I felt, you know, we had holes here. Um, you know, in regards to. So after developing the themes, that's when I sat down and finally ordered materials and supplies to kind of match those themes. So my makerspace is set up. Um, I, have, I have two main areas to the makerspace. I call them flexible stations and fixed stations. Our fixed stations were the first things that I set up in the makerspace. So those include stations that are out in the makerspace always. They don't change, they don't rotate, um, they, are, they are there for the duration. The, the flexible stations include activities based on themes that require a little bit more time for the students to work on, a little bit more teacher direction and intervention and support. 
Um, so our flexible stations tend to rotate in and out of the space on no real set schedule. But, you know, every couple of weeks I have something new that pops up in the maker space in one of our flexible stations. But the first thing I set up were those fixed stations. So about how long did it take you to plan and then about how long did it take you to get the tools into the space? Um, only a couple of weeks, really. Um, you know, the idea behind our fixed stations is that the activities in the fixed stations are easy and they don't take a lot of time. You know, making was something that was new to our entire school community. Um, so I, I wanted there to be a low barrier of entry for every one of our fixed stations, meaning that anybody who walked into the library, whether they were non-English speaking um, or one of our engineering students or somewhere in between, could sit down and make something immediately with very little teacher facilitation. So, you know, the things that we have out there are things that aren't very complicated, actually. One of our stations is a Lego station. We have a, a, one of our library tables that I repurposed into a Lego table. So at that Lego table, we just have traditional Lego bricks. We have simple machine Lego bricks and um, motorized Legos. Um, and a lot of people get those things based on donations, you know, which doesn't have to, have to take a lot of time at all. I happen to purchase ours new, but even that, you know, didn't take a lot of time. So within a week or two, we had our Lego table ready to go since we made it ourselves. And, it, you know, I ordered those Lego bricks to come in right away. In addition to our Lego table, another one of our fixed stations is our Little Bits bar, where we have Little Bits, which are um, electronic modules that snap together. Um, and for that little bits bar, I really have only two little bits kits, um, which doesn't cost a lot and you know doesn't doesn't include a lot of materials. So that was a very easy station to set up quickly. And again, within a few weeks, we had that set up. One of our other fixations are our take apart text or is our take apart text station, where our technology department here at New Milford High School actually gives us computers that they normally would have discarded because they're slow, you know, they're working, but they're not, you know, up to the standard of where we need our computers to be. They never give us anything that's broken. They only give us things that, you know, they were getting rid of because, you know, they were outdated or running slowly or something like that. Um, and the kids love that. And the Take Apart Tech Station is completely free and based on things that we had right here in our school. So that took no time at all to put together. We also have a Makey Makey station, which is one of our fixed stations. And again, that took no time at all. All I did was order a few Makey Makey kits and set up a little station with you know, some directions and some guidance for the children. And, and that was it. And another one of our stations is our 3D printing and design station. So that's based on our MakerBot printer. So all I had to do was order that. And once that was in, we were ready to go. So within a few weeks, everything was ready to be launched. You know, it's all very organic, too. I, I really believed that, and it's actually, you know, true, that what I put out there during that first week our Makerspace launched has taken shape and changed in so many ways based on, you know, the students who are in their space, their interests and their needs and what direction they want to take things. So I kind of didn't wait for it to be perfect. I sort of just put out there what I thought was a good start and sort of took it from there. So... I want to back up just a little bit and just get a number here because I know that some people are going to get into a perpetual planning mode because what you're talking about sounds really cool, but a lot of people are going to get stuck in the planning phase. How long did you actually spend planning? Not long at all. You know, I talk to people all the time who want to pilot their makerspace. They want to spend a year researching it. They want to spend a year piloting it and then eventually establish their own makerspace. And, you know, to me, it's all very fluid and organic, especially our makerspace is an informal learning space. So that means it's not a requirement for any class. It's a space that students can visit if they want to and choose to, which many of them do. Um, so, yeah, I think a lot of people tend to get hung up on that planning planning phase. And I do think that phase is important, but I hate to see people getting stuck there. Um, you know, I think a little assessment in the beginning, talking to your students, talking to your staff, looking at the existing programs and curricula, taking into standards and global trends and best practices. You know, it, it, that, that doesn't have to be a long process. And for us, it was only a few weeks. 
So it sounds like if you take a few weeks planning and then a few weeks starting some simple things that within six to eight weeks you should be able to have a makerspace running in your school if you're willing to just go give it a shot. Absolutely, absolutely. And something I really try to emphasize with people is that no two makerspaces should be alike and no two makerspaces really are alike. I've never seen two that are exactly the same and that's how it should be. There's no right way to do this. There's no wrong way to do this. It's what you think is right for your school community and what your students think is right and what your you know, teachers think is right and your administrators. The idea of making opens itself up to being so accepting of the idea of failing and in failing, sometimes the, the, the greatest innovations take place. So if something doesn't work in your space, you, you kind of just shift directions and change it and refine it. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't have to be this perfect space that you launch from the beginning. So what other tools have you added to the makerspace since the first uh, simple tools you've just suggested? All of those things are actually still out there, and I really believe in those fixed stations because Makerspace, you know, as I said, it has that low barrier of entry. This way, anybody in the entire school community can come in at any point during the school day and participate. And I try to not be so involved with those fixed stations because I feel like the more I'm involved, the more it feels like a regular class to them, and I don't want it to have that feel. Um, so really the makerspace as it stands with those fixed stations is really set up to run itself. Now that doesn't mean that I'm not, you know, pulling the strings. I always call myself the wizard in the Wizard of Oz. I'm behind the curtain. I know what's going on. And, you know, I set up things so that students take things in a certain direction. They just don't always know it. And I think that really has been key to that space flourishing as it as it is. So you have added a couple of other tools because you mentioned the take apart yeah. station and the little bits bar and Legos. Yes. And there are a couple of other things that uh, I think it would be fun to talk about just a little bit. I know that you, well, I'll let you tell us what some of those other things are. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when we launched last October, I really, in my mind, had kind of a scope and sequence of where we were as a school community in relation to the idea of making and where I wanted us to be. And where I wanted us to be, had I put materials out in that space, you know, that were in line with some of those ideas, I think that we would have, the makerspace would have not been as successful um, because some of those things were just a little bit too challenging. And as a school, we weren't ready for those things. But I'm really happy to say that, you know, a year later, I have seen such growth as a school community that things that, you know, were challenging for our students last year and new for our students last year, this year are a piece of cake. So this year we've progressed, you know, for example, at our take apart tech station to not only taking apart tech technology, but putting it back together so that it works again. And we've even progressed to building computers from scratch um, and even troubleshooting computers, which is which is really neat. And, you know, last year, had I just had a station in the library where we built our own computers, many kids wouldn't have had any idea of what to do. But it was their experiences in our Take Apart Tech Station that have, have sort of led us down this path, and it's been quite amazing. We've been experimenting with Arduino boards now, and again, that's something that last year had we had in this space. Most kids didn't even have that word in their vocabulary here, but now they're ready for it, that they're actually asking for it. They're pushing me out of, out of my own comfort zone into realms that I never thought I would be going before. And it's super cool because every day I learn something new from them. So the students, the students are really driving this space and they sounds like they, they have since the beginning because that's where you started by going out and asking them what they wanted to do. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Eric, working for Eric was was awesome. And really the the success that I had was really attributed to his philosophy of giving up control and trusting your staff and trusting the students. Um, so his philosophy kind of affected how I 
um, am in the library as a whole and particularly with the makerspace. You know, I gave up that control that I that I think that I felt I had to have um, in other you know roles that I've had in my career, like a traditional classroom teacher and, and whatnot. But I, I really thought this was an opportunity to give up some of that control and really um, trust the students to take control of their own learning, which is, you know, that's a phrase we hear an awful lot about. And I have to say that even though I thought I had done some of that throughout my career, I don't think I really had done that completely until this maker space. Wow. So I, yeah. I just need to interject here. Uh, we've mentioned uh, Eric just a couple of times here, and we're speaking of uh, Eric Scheninger for those who are listening who might not be familiar with Eric Scheninger. And he was one of our early podcast guests. I think he was in one of the first four podcasts. Mm -hmm. And Eric likes to talk about the idea of leadership and uh, the differences maybe between uh, leading and managing and how that is done in the digital world that we live in. How have some of his ideas influenced uh, how you created your makerspace? Well, I think that really, you know, besides giving up control and trusting my students, I think his ideas also emphasized to me that we needed to we need to create unique learning environments that work for our kids you know spaces that they need that they want that they value and those learning environments should reflect the reality their reality um, and give them opportunities to contribute you know so for example in addition to our maker space in our library we also allow food and drink i even have a coffee tea and hot chocolate station we are a byod school but you know we also encourage the use of cell phones in our library by providing charging stations for the students to use for their personal devices we not only circulate books, but we also circulate Chromebooks. In fact, I circulate more Chromebooks than I do traditional books to students who might need one for the day or want one for the day or even the night or weekend, we allow them to take them home for. So I think all of those things are, are really things that Eric kind of modeled in his leadership. I think that you've hit on an important point there and maybe we'll uh, dig here for just a minute because I think as educators, uh, we get confused sometimes as to where learning begins. And, yeah. and I don't think you're confused about that. I'm sh quite sure Eric isn't confused about that, but I was confused about that for a long time. I mean, I kind of grew up in the, an environment where everything was mostly lecture style. And I had to unlearn a lot of that as I came to the maker movement. Absolutely. I agree with you. In fact, one of our tech guys here all the time says to me, and I should add that he's actually one of my former students. I was his classroom teacher when he was in fourth grade, and now he works here at the high school as one of our tech guys. And he says to me all the time, stop being such a teacher, <laughs> because he has that maker mindset. You know, he is totally a DIY guy. Um, and can make something out of anything. It astonishes me daily. But you're right, you know, you kind of have to unschool yourself a little bit and open yourself up to this idea of making and all that it should be. So we're going to start winding it down here. And there's two questions I always like to ask in the podcast. And the first one is actually a digital question. In our digital age, where, you know, we have uh, devices and Google and Wikipedia, and all these things, all this knowledge is at our fingertips. What does it mean in that environment to be educated? You know, from my perspective, I feel like our makerspace has kind of been the antithesis to the common core and, you know, has proven that in this digital age, in this age of the common core and standardized testing and assessment, there is room for creativity and invention and innovation so that's something that we're really proud of here, especially in this in this age of the Common Core. We really managed to democratize some of these STEM related concepts and really, I think, begin to create complete learners as opposed to learners who, who don't have room in the school day to, to innovate and experiment and even play. I think all of these things um, kind of provide the model of a complete learner. So you mentioned a complete learner and yeah. I maybe wrap this up in a nice neat little package here with all the things we've been talking about what is the purpose of an education 
Uh, well, I think, you know, it's interesting, especially being up here at the high school now, you know, I see things on the other end. And for me, I feel like my purpose here with these students is to get them ready for the world that they're going to be entering. And, you know, I'm so happy to say that through the experiences so many of them have had in our makerspace, I know that it has impacted them beyond the four walls of our library. And, you know, their college majors, their career choices have often been based on the experiences that they've had here in our makerspace. Um, so to me, my purpose in their life and, and educating them is to prepare them for the real world and expose them to opportunities that maybe they had never considered before. Well, thank you so much for taking time to talk to us in the podcast. I'm going to ask you to stay on a little bit afterwards. But as we wrap up, why don't you let people know how they can get in touch with you and perhaps ask questions or get involved in some of the things you've been talking about and how to get your book. Yeah, sure. Um, actually, all that information is right on my blog. And my blog is worlds-of-learning.com. Um, I'm also very active on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at NMHS underscore LMS. And you can follow along actually with all of our makerspace progress at our makerspace hashtag, which is um, Worlds of Making, which is the same title of the book that was just released. So the book information is on my blog as well. We will link that stuff up in the show notes to make it easy for people to connect to you. Thank you, Laura, for taking time to talk to us today. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Now, today's great inventor secret, flying by the seat of your pants. In the process of inventing, it is tempting to make a plan, and another plan, and a different plan, then a new plan, then a better plan. The only problem with planning is that planning can be an end in itself. Once we start to plan, we may find ourselves planning until our beards grow long or our luxurious locks grow down to our toes. Too much planning can actually be a trap. Now, I'm not advocating that we abandon ever planning anything in our lives. However, once we have a basic outline of where we're going and have information to begin, we should begin. Invariably, when we take this approach, though, someone will say, you're crazy to fly by the seat of your pants like that. And for those of us who actually think a little before leaping, those words can sting a little because it impugns our motives. However, I want to convince you today that you should indeed start flying by the seat of your pants. The phrase flying by the seat of your pants hails back to a news story about Douglas Corrigan, a pilot from the 1930s. By the time this story came out, planes were beginning to have good instruments but some pilots still preferred to use their own five senses when flying. These senses could be honed to razor sharpness by experience and practice. If you've ever been in a plane, you'll remember that light feeling when a plane dives and the heavy feeling when it pulls up. These feelings are important clues to the orientation and condition of the plane. And acquiring a sharp discernment about the sensations required plenty of practice. However, it was practice that could never be gotten in the safety of the hangar or the coffee shop. The pilot had to actually go out, get into the plane, fire it up, and roar off into the blue in order to get this experience. There are many situations in life where more planning, more preparation, or more thinking simply won't move us forward. Babies, for instance, do not read an instruction manual prior to learning to roll over, then crawl, then walk, then run. They just try it. And they learn to walk by the feelings they get in their ears or in the soles of their feet. However, somewhere along the way, we learn the skill of planning things first. Some use this skill to get even better at flying by the seat of their pants. But others use planning as a safe cocoon from which they never have to emerge to actually fly. So, as a great inventor, we have to learn the skill of actually trying things. Just trying something can be dangerous, but not trying can be just as deleterious to our future as an inventor. I can think of one time in particular that, as a 13-year-old, I discovered why an 8-foot-tall teeter-totter doesn't totter well with the normal crossbeam length. As a kid, 
I was always trying something unusual, and because I grew up in the southeast, a curious young teenager there had access to lots of trees for experimentation. One day, I got the brilliant idea that if a one and a half foot tall teeter-totter was fun, then an eight foot tall teeter-totter would be an absolute blast. My dad's wood supply was absolutely off limits, so my brother and I had to improvise. Heading out into the woods by the house, we found several medium-sized trees and cut them down for our little project. Now, I'm a little more respectful of the effort that a tree goes through to become 30 feet tall these days, but at the time, I was just curious about mega teetering. So, after an hour or two, we managed to construct two triangles out of the trees for the fulcrum. And if my memory serves me, we allowed the triangular sections to protrude past the tops of the triangles to create a little cradle. Then we used a short cross section to rest in the cradle at the top of each triangle. And this short cross section was fastened to the teetering cross beam to which we also nailed a couple of scrap boards for seats that we thought my dad wouldn't miss. Finally, we had a giant teeter-totter, eight feet tall at the fulcrum and about 20 feet long. I'm not sure which of us was the brave soul who took the tall seat first, but it was probably my younger brother, Chad. He always seemed to get the crummy job in my projects. Sorry, buddy. I sat in the lower seat as he inched along out onto the crossbeam and out to the seat, now elevated 15 or 16 feet in the air. It was going to be great. I knew this invention was going to be fantastic. Finally, Chad made it all the way out to the high seat, and we negotiated how we were going to do this, so I didn't get flung into the next county. Okay, go for it, I hollered. He leaned way back in the seat, and I prepared to be launched. Nothing. Try it again, but harder this time, I yelled back. He leaned as far forward as possible, and then whipped himself backward with considerably more force this time nothing. As hard as you can! I was getting desperate. He tried again with all of his might, but nothing. Then he proceeded to fling himself with all of his might to get that silly teeter to totter. As I watched him, he looked like a kid on a trampoline. The other end of the quickly failing invention bounced up and down and up and down, but my end stayed firmly on the ground. With the wisdom of years and a little physics, I now know that the solution was a longer crossbeam, or a ridiculous launch speed. But I learned that day that bigger is not always better. My invention was a bit of a dud, but I learned more about physics from that little experiment than a month's worth of classwork. So even though my flying by the seat of my pants experiment didn't work as planned, we did manage to make a pretty sweet catapult by dropping heavy stuff on it from the second story porch, maybe in another story. But at 13, I would never have gone looking for a mathematical solution to learning more about fulcrums. However, building a larger than life teeter-totter had a wealth of insights to teach. So remember this week, to be a great inventor, move from planning to doing and you'll find one of the most powerful weapons in your arsenal of invention. Have you been enjoying the Tabletop Inventing Podcast? Have comments or questions you'd like us to address? Contact us, and we'll think through the comments and answer your questions here in the podcast. And be sure to let us know if you'd like a shout-out or to remain anonymous. You can share your comments and questions at www.ttinvent.com slash podcast or by emailing us at podcast at ttinvent.com. Let's discuss your thoughts and questions. Join us again next time when we will again seek to answer the question, what is the purpose of an education? And as educators, how do we awaken the inventor in each of our students?